morning, Purpose Church, good to see you. Uh, this Tuesday, June 15th, uh, there are going to be some major COVID changes in California. So next Sunday, Father's Day, that's just going to be a great day uh, to come back in person, uh, to in-person services. And why don't you bring an important man in your life? Uh, next Sunday is going to be so much fun on Father's Day. Hope you can come back and uh, join us in person after those changes that are happening here in California on uh, Tuesday. Now, to get, today we're going to continue our summer series uh, called Flipped. It's based on a study of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, when Jesus steps into your life or into your culture, he flips everything upside down. And we're going to cover Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30, and talk about how sex is a great gift from God, but it is not the greatest gift from God. Now, many things in life uh, make for great gifts, but lousy gods. Uh, they're great gifts, just not good to make them our uh, gods. Uh, just about the time that I was uh, preparing this point in my message, I opened up an early Father's Day gift from uh, two of my daughters, uh, our daughters, uh, Abigail and Leah. And uh, they had been together when Leah came out from Seattle uh, to visit her sister in Washington, D.C. Uh, they were eating at a Cracker Barrel. And so they got this gift for their dad on Father's Day because they know whenever we travel, I love uh, to eat at Cracker Barrel. It just kind of takes you back to that comfort food of your childhood if you're a person uh, about my age. And so they got me this hat and they got me this shirt uh, from, from Cracker Barrel. And there are two um, new ones now in, in California. California had never had a Cracker Barrel, but now they just got one a couple of years ago in Victorville and there's one in Rialto. Now this is a Cracker Barrel gift card. And this is a great, great gift if you use it appropriately. If you use it in the right way, this can be a great gift. But it is a lousy God. Uh, if you get addicted um, to Cracker Barrel, uh, it'll break your health. If you break into a Cracker Barrel to eat there after hours because you're so obsessed with it, uh, that'll get you in trouble. If it causes you to hurt someone, uh, true story, I was uh, sitting at a Cracker Barrel, um, I can't remember which of the kids was with me, in North Syracuse, New York. And we're sitting there about, about to eat, and a lady in her car comes straight for the window where we're sitting at Cracker Barrel. She tips over, knocks over uh, the handicapped parking sign, and the car was coming straight toward us, um, right towards the window where we were sitting, and stopped uh, just uh, short. I, so I thought, man, uh, going to die here in Cracker Barrel, but what, what a way to go. I can't think of a more fun way to go than to get run over through the glass, a uh, car uh, gotten loose uh, at a Cracker Barrel. Uh, if it becomes an obsession, Cracker Barrel can be a great gift, but it can be a lousy God. Now, I'm going to feel so bad um, talking in any way negatively about this precious couple. Uh, this is Ray and Wilma Yoder from Indiana. And uh, the, they look like the dearest couple. And so I just, I hate to use them as a, as a somewhat negative illustration. But they have been on a 40-year quest to visit every Cracker Barrel in the United States. And they just, in the last few months, they just finished visiting Cracker Barrel number 645 out of 645 Cracker Barrels. Now this is such a sweet couple. But my goodness... Um, there are better obsessions, and they probably did this while RVing across the country. So I, so I, I don't want to be, you know, a, a jerk about this. But think about the money and the time and the energy to visit every single Cracker Barrel in the United States. A Cracker Barrel is a great gift, but it makes for a lousy obsession. It makes for a lousy God. And sex is one of those things. Sex is a great gift. It just doesn't make a, a good God. It doesn't make a, a good center of your life, a, a good obsession. It's kind of like fire. You keep a fire in a fireplace, it's a wonderful thing, keeps you warm. But if a fire gets out of the fireplace, it'll burn your house down. Uh, sex is like nuclear energy. If it stays in the nuclear reactor, if it stays in the confines of where it's supposed to be, it'll provide energy for a city. 
But if it gets out like it did at Chernobyl in the Ukraine, it can kill many people and, and destroy a city. So contained, it can provide energy for a city. Non-contained, it can destroy a city. Now our culture seems to be increasingly obsessed with sex. And yet at the same time, it's just an interesting combination. We're obsessed with it as a culture, and yet at the same time, it's become incredibly degraded as well. I mean, on most comedies today, sexual relations are just treated so crudely, so commonly, in such a degraded fashion. Sexual relations have been treated with the same degradation as urination and defecation. I mean, this precious, holy gift from God is now treated like uh, the lowest parts of our life and, and the most degraded parts of our life. Now, after Jesus flipped everything upside down, uh, the early church became known in the Greco-Roman culture as the only ones who treated sex as a holy and precious gift. Everybody in Greco-Roman culture, they were treated it in the de degraded uh, fashion that we do today. And yet Christians stood out. They were the ones that saw it as holy, as a precious gift from God to be opened, a gift only to be opened, to be unwrapped in biblical marriage. And I believe the same thing is happening today, just like it did uh, in pre-Christian days, now in post-Christian culture, uh, society of the United States of America, it's happening for us as well. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Eric uh, Holmstrom, Pastor Eric and I have been reading a book called uh, The Triumph of Christianity by Rodney Stark. And he's like the foremost expert, historian, uh, historical expert, on the Greco-Roman period in which the early church uh, was started. And he writes, devout Christian, uh, devout Christian married couples may have had sex more often than did the average pagan couple because brides were older when they got married and because husbands were less likely to take up with other women. And so one of the things that attracted people to Christianity was the way they treated sexual relations, the way they treated marriage, in the same way that sociologists today say that marriage is more and more becoming a Christian thing. Um, a, a marriage is, and, and, and sex within marriage is kind of, well, that's what the followers of Christ do, and not anybody else. And it was the same way in the early church, it's the same way uh, today. Now, in order to understand Jesus' teaching on this subject, uh, we need to look at the, uh, at the biblical view of sex which underlies it. Uh, the themes in scripture of creation, fall, redemption, and glorification. Uh, let's, let's watch this together. Sex. Throughout the Bible, it's proclaimed as a good thing. A profound expression of love that forges a unique and powerful bond between a man and a woman. But along the way, something went seriously wrong. When humanity left their perfect and life-giving relationship with God, sin entered the scene and infected everything. Sin caused people to become disconnected from God, from each other, and from themselves. Sex, the ultimate connection between men and women, couldn't hide for long. Sin grabbed hold of sex and transformed it into something completely unrecognizable. This new form of sex had nothing to do with respect or commitment, and everything to do with lust and control. It was no longer about two people becoming one. Sex became about the desires of the individual, a way for people to get what they want from one another. To put it plainly, sex became a transaction. And so, sex strayed further and further away from God's original plan. Fast forward to today, and sex is everywhere. People are obsessed with it. Sex, which used to be a good thing, became an ultimate thing. Something that validates one's very existence and a reason for living. And with its new and elevated status came many promises. Promises it couldn't deliver, leaving an entire society feeling empty and disillusioned. But like any addiction, the answer is always more. More relationships, more romance, and of course, more sex. And it's in this endless search that we find ourselves. Sex is clearly broken, but it isn't the real problem. It's simply the crack on the surface. The real problem of sin goes much deeper and its consequences are far more devastating. Here's the good news though. There's still hope. God can redeem you and your sexuality. Sex can be a good thing again. 
Now, there are four major themes that run through the Bible. The first is is creation. Sex is good because God created it. Uh, Genesis 1, verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. God saw all that he had made, and it was very, very good. And so God is the one that came up with the idea of uh, of sex. Sometimes we think that God was surprised by the whole thing. And he looks down from heaven and says, what will they think up next? Look what they're getting into now. No, Uh, God's the one that created it from the beginning. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 23. uh, The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. It was something like this. Uh, Adam is naming the animals. And so God is bringing them to him, and he's, he's running out of names to come up with. So next one comes up, orangutan, writes it down. Next one comes up, uh, how about yak, writes it down. Next one comes up, zebra, writes it down. And all of a sudden, God brings him Eve. And he looks up from taking his notes, and he looks up and he sees Eve, and he goes, whoa, man, woman. And he writes it down. I'm sure it was something like that. 40 years ago today, I laid uh, eyes on Kimberly for the first time. Uh, She had come to Christ in college at Boston University and was looking for a church when she came home for summer vacation, uh, summer break, and she walked into the church. I'd only been there a a couple of Sundays, a brand new 24-year-old single pastor in a rural, little rural church up near the Canadian border. So 40 years ago today, I first laid eyes on Kimberly the way Adam uh, first laid eyes on Eve. Now, uh, Eve didn't have any clothes on, but, so Kimberly was fully clothed. Uh, but for the first time, I laid eyes on her 40 years ago today. And man, when I saw her, I was like, whoa, man, woman. And then she came back the next Sunday with her fiance and, and wanted me to perform the marriage. And so I go, whoa, man. And then they broke up. And I was like, whoa, man. Uh, So first of all, all creation, uh, the Bible says that sex is good because God created it. Uh, As a matter of fact, one entire book of the Bible, the Song of Songs, is devoted to sex and to romance. Now the second theme through scripture is the fall. When when we, we fell and we disobeyed God, and now sex became complicated. But then the other theme in Scripture is redemption. Sex can be restored, just like everything else uh, that God wants to restore and bring it back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden once again. And then comes glorification. Sex is not an end in and of itself. Uh, This earthly life is not the end, and so sex is not an end in itself. It points us to something way more amazing. Uh, You've heard me use this illustration before, that this little dot at the end of this rope represents this brief time that we're alive uh, during this life. Just a flash in the pan. Just a moment, it's over with. But the line, the rope, that represents all of eternity, just going on and on into infinity. And so God tells us to live our lives, this, this little dot here, live for the line, live for eternity, not Uh, for the dot. And being single and celibate is a perfectly fulfilling way to live your life during the dot. Uh, Some people, uh, like half of our church family is married, half uh, half of our church family is single. So half of us are single, half of us are married. Both are wonderful ways, fulfilling ways, God can bless us during uh, the dot. But whatever we do, whether we're single or married, we're to be living ultimately not for the dot, not for this brief moment called this life, 
but to live for eternity, uh, to live uh, for glorification. And so that fourth theme is glorification. Sex is not an end in and of itself. Uh, everyone is single at some stage in their life. Think about that. Everybody's single at some stage in their life. I was, you know, I, I was single till you know almost 27 years of age. Everybody's single at some stage in their life. Uh, Jesus himself was single. Now, sex and marriage are a great gift. They're just not the greatest gift. The great gift, but they're just not the greatest gift. Uh, Paul, who was single, tells us about the greatest gift in Ephesians 5, verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So sex and marriage. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. That's the greatest gift. Unity with Christ is the greatest gift. Uh, sex is a great gift. Marriage is a, is a great gift. Singleness is a great gift. But the greatest gift is Christ in the church. Unity with Christ, uh, glorification. Now, God gave us the seventh commandment, Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Now, he gave us this command because it hurts people. Adultery hurts people terribly. It breaks up marriages. It breaks up families. But he also gave it to us because adultery destroys the picture that marriage is to provide between Christ and the church. Now with that background, we can look at what Jesus says to us in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's gonna say five things here. Uh, first of all, he's gonna say, be radical. Nikki Gumbel writes, being a Christian is not just a nice addition to your life. As though we could say, I've bought a car, I've joined a gym, I've become a Christian. Rather, it is both radical and countercultural and always has been. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That's the Old Testament command. But I tell you, that's, that's how he flips things. That's how he th turns things upside down. It used to be just that only the physical act of adultery, that's the only thing that was considered sin at that time. Uh, but he says to us that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus says that the command just doesn't apply to the physical act, but to the heart and to the mind as well. Uh, the command to not commit adultery, uh, to commit, uh, not to commit adultery is not just about the letter of the law, but it's also about the spirit of the law as well. Now, um, this is, is, is radical stuff. Uh, this is flipped. Uh, this is countercultural. This is revolutionary. It was in Jesus' time, and it is today as well. A 22-year-old film studies graduate uh, who was interviewed in London, and she was uh, still a virgin. Um, here's, here's what she said in that interview. I've decided that when I have sex for the first time, I want it to be special, and I will wait until my wedding night. Having watched her friends get hurt over the years, she feels vindicated by her decision. A lot of my friends have casual flings, and I've noticed that the ones who jump into bed with someone too soon are the ones who often get hurt the most when the relationship flounders. People may be surprised that I'm still a virgin in my 20s because there's such pressure on young women to, quote, enjoy themselves and apparently feel liberated by having lots of lovers. Because of my choices, I've never had to worry about sexually transmitted diseases, pregnancy, or any of the other troubles which can go hand in hand with casual sex. But it has not been easy. It is not easy, but it is the way of the followers of Christ, and there is great blessing and joy uh, in that path. And so the first thing Jesus says is to be radical. Secondly, he says to be romantic. Uh, here's a, a list of Jeff Foxworthy's warnings uh, for when we may need to, to work on this. Those of us that are married, uh, we, we may need to work on the romance factor when our, in our relationship if any of these things uh, are true. Um, first of all, if your special restaurant has a drive through window, you might need to work on your romance. If you bought her Guitar Hero for Valentine's Day, you might need to work on your romance. If the only time the two of you go away for the weekend is for deer camp, okay, this is for Southern Virginians like myself, but this is a little bit of an inside joke, you might need to work on your romance. 
If your wife wears socks, sweatpants, and an oversized t-shirt to bed for your anniversary, you might need to work on your romance. If the last time you really kissed her, you were watching a football game out of the corner of your eye, you might need to work on your romance. If you only light candles <laughs> to cover up unwanted smells, you might need to work on your romance. If you really don't feel comfortable being intimate when your kids are in the same house, city, or time zone, you might need to work on your romance. Uh, if the last time she ran her fingers through your hair, she was checking for ticks, <laughs> you might need to work on your romance. Uh, if the only time she says to you, turn off the lights and lock the door, is when your parents pull into the driveway, you might need to work on your romance. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 4, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Uh, Nikki Gumbel writes, uh, Jesus tells us that it is not just love and sex that go together. Sex also goes together with long-term commitment in marriage. Such commitment is shown today in our society by the marriage vows. Marriage is not just a, a piece of paper, nor is the wedding day simply dressing up and having a party with family and friends. It is a public, responsible expression of lifelong commitment. It is in this context that sex then signifies, seals, and brings about an unbreakable personal unity. Without such a commitment, sex is cheapened. It becomes a life-uniting act without a life-uniting intention. The life-uniting in intent is evidenced by marriage and marriage alone. Uh, one of the greatest uh, sex symbols of the last uh, generation was the Mexican-American actor Ricardo Montalban. And uh, maybe you remember him as Mr. Rourke uh, from Fantasy Island. Or you Star Trek fans, you might remember him as Khan uh, from Wrath of Khan. Uh, he was a devout Catholic, and he said that his faith was the most important thing in his life. He married actress and model Georgiana Young in 1944. They were married for 63 years until she died in 2007, and he died 14 months later. And he was once asked in a television interview this question. What makes for a great lover? And here's what he said. A great lover is someone who can satisfy one woman all her life long and who can be satisfied by one woman all his life long. A great lover is not someone who goes from woman to woman. Any dog can do that. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> he, is, uh, he is speaking straightforward there, isn't he? And then number three, the third thing Jesus says is to be re repentant. Be repentant. Um, if, as God convicts us, we need to stop any sexual relationship that is outside of marriage. We need to get rid of any pornography. We need to go to celebrate recovery or the landing on Tuesday nights here at the church for encouragement and accountability. We need to stop watching or reading anything that tempts us we need to put our computer in a public play area in our home in order to avoid temptation. There's, and, and there's tremendous victory and joy in repentance. Repentance is not a negative word. Repentance is a word that transforms us and gives us the victory and the joy and the blessing that God intended for us to have. Now we tend to think about King David and Bathsheba, that story in the Bible, as a story of failure. Uh, but, and it is, it is, but it is actually also a story about repentance and victory and restored joy. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. Here's the first mistake he made is that he got away from his purpose. God had created him and had placed him there as king of Israel in order to defend them against their enemies, against their intruders. And he just kind of took a break 
from the purpose that God had for him in his life. And that's when he gets into trouble. Uh, one evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. He's, he's bored. He's gotten away from the, the purpose for which God created him. And so he's just walking around. That's another time when we get into trouble. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. That's his third mistake. No harm in just finding out about her, is there? No, no harm in looking, no, no harm in just getting some more information. The man said she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife, that should have been a clue to him right there, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. That's his fourth mistake. She came to him and said, and she came to him, and he slept with her. But really, sleeping with her goes back to the previous four decisions. It all started back when he didn't go out and do what he was supposed to do, leading his troops into battle. It all started back there. And it was just one small decision after another ends up with this one. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness, then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. And this sets off just a tragic domino effect in David's life and in the whole, had an impact in the whole nation of Israel. People died because of this thing uh, that he did. But then he has a friend by the name of Nathan who's willing to confront him. And boy, that is a friend. When you've got a friend that's willing to hold you accountable and confront you when you get off course. And Nathan was one of those friends. And he confronts David about this sin. And then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He, he, he owns it. He, he, he repents. And, and here's just a little thing. Boy, you just find these little nuggets in God's word uh, so many times. And it's just so amazing how, how much is in there. And if you go to an obscure list of the children of David, in 1 Chronicles 14, verse 4, it talks about the four children he had with Bathsheba. So it is obviously after this event. These are the names of the children born to David and Bathsheba there. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. He, you know, a person confronts you with something you've done wrong. Uh, sometimes you don't have the warmest feelings towards them. But David so appreciated what Nathan had done for him. And Bathsheba as well. David and Bathsheba so appreciated that the wounds of a friend are faithful. And they so appreciated that, that they actually name one of their children. Boy, would I name, I'm trying to think of the person that confronted me uh, in the toughest possible way. I appreciate that grudgingly, but to the point of enthusiastically naming one of my children after them, uh, that just shows how deeply and thoroughly uh, David repented. If you read Psalm 51, that beautiful psalm, read it before you go to bed tonight, that song of repentance where he pours out his heart, says, oh God, forgive me and give me my joy back once again. And even though there continue to be consequences for the rest of David's life because of this, God gave him his joy back. And he finished well. And the same thing can be true for us as well if we repent. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not feel condemnation from this message. Feel conviction from this message. Repent based on that conviction and you'll get your joy and your victory and your purpose back in your life once again. And then number four, Jesus says to be ruthless. Uh, Jesus says to take extreme action in fighting sin. Now, this applies to all sin, all sin. You know, Jesus never suggests, the Bible never suggests that sexual sin is worse than any other sin. Sometimes it hints at the fact that there are greater just natural consequences as far as broken hearts and, and broken lives. But uh, Jesus and the Bible never, God's word never suggests that sexual sin is worse than any other sin. And so what Jesus is going to say here, it applies to all sin, not just uh, to sexual sin. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. 
It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, Jesus didn't mean this literally. There was one man in church history that took it literally. His name was Origen of Alexandria. And in 200 AD, uh, he, he, he lived about that time in the early 200s AD after Christ. Um, he took what Jesus said literally. And he didn't do it with his eye or his hand or in another passage Jesus talked about uh, cutting off your foot if it causes you to walk into sin um, or your eye if you see something that causes you to sin or your, your hand. Uh, he, he didn't do it with any of those um, Oh, let me just be discreet here and say that it was another part of his body that he chose to, to cut off uh, as a result of this teaching of Jesus, which was completely a false interpretation and application of it. As a matter of fact, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, they banned anyone from doing this. The uh, Nicene Creed, and they had all these other great theological treatises. One of the things they dealt with as well is to tell everybody, don't be like Origen. Don't literally do this. Jesus meant, what he meant uh, by this was to be extreme in dealing with temptation and sin. Now, Jesus may not have meant cutting off a part of your body, but he certainly meant putting protections on your computer. He certainly meant not having lunch with someone of the opposite sex if you're married, alone. He certainly meant not having that lunch date or dinner date alone with somebody from the opposite sex if you're a married, if you're a married person. Uh, Kimberly and I, 39 years ago this week, 39 years ago this week, 40 years ago today, I laid eyes on her for the first time. 39, 39 years ago, a uh, year later, um, I asked her out to lunch. And that is the only time I can remember ever in 40 years as a pastor uh, going alone uh, to lunch uh, with, 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 uh, with a woman. And, uh, and Kimberly didn't think anything of it. She said, hey, I'd like to check out, talk about Christian grad schools. And um, I said, sure, let's go to lunch. She thought nothing of it. She had just uh, come from college. She had just finished her junior year in college. No big deal. But I'm thinking to myself, Glenn, you're, you're breaking your rule here. You're crossing a line. <laughs> and uh, Kimberly always says we went out to lunch um, uh, in order to talk about Christian grad schools and, and six children and like what? 30 years later, something like that, she finally got that uh, master's uh, of, um, uh, degree from, uh, full, from Fuller Seminary. Another thing about that date is that the very date of our first date together, our first lunch together, our son John was born uh, in an orphanage in Columbia, South America. So is that crazy or what? That the day of our first, that first lunch we had um, uh, 39 years ago this week, was the exact same day that our son John uh, was born in Columbia, South America. Now, temptation is not sin. Remember we talked about this with anger? Don't waste energy feeling guilty for being angry. No, there's, there's no sin in feeling angry. It, it's what you do with that anger. And Martin Luther uh, once said that you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. And so there's no sin. Don't waste energy feeling guilty. Oh, I was tempted. No, there's no sin in temptation. It's whether you let that bird land in your hair, build a nest in your hair. By the way, we that are bald are more godly than everybody else because ain't no bird building a nest in my hair. But it's letting it, it, letting it sit there. That's where the sin comes. Uh, someone once asked, what is the difference between looking and looking lustfully? And I would say about two seconds. <laughs> There's about a two second difference between looking uh, at somebody from the opposite sex, oh my goodness, uh, and looking lustfully. It's about a two second difference between the bird flying over your head and building a nest in your hair. Graham Tomlin writes that lust is like eczema. The more we scratch it, the more it itches. Sometimes Satan fools us into, into thinking that, you know, if we just give into it a little bit, we'll, we'll quote, get it out of our system. It doesn't work that way. 
Uh, like he says, the, the more you scratch it, the more it itches. Uh, the more we fight it, on the other hand, the stronger we get and the weaker the temptation becomes. James 4, verse 7, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then number five, Jesus challenged us uh, to be role models. A couple of weeks ago, we, we studied where Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And I just want to say, if there is ever an area today where we as followers of Christ need to be salt and light, it is in this area. And if you're single, like I said, like half of our church family is, uh, it will be especially challenging to be salt and, and light in this area, but also it will be an especially powerful witness to a watching world. Uh, in your singleness, God has given you a, a tremendous opportunity to, to be salt and light, to be countercultural, to be radical in following Jesus in this area. Uh, Mike Pilavachi, who is tremendously, tremendously used by God, and he says one of the reasons he's been able to be used by God so much is because he's single. He has the time and energy to focus on the calling God has on his life. He says, for some of us, our calling is to celibacy for life. For others, it's for a season. For some of us, we thought it was for a season, and it ends up being for life. Uh, Mary Tornyenyor writes, not everybody is doing it. Not all Christian singles are having sex. Don't let this season fool you. Stay pure. And then Lisa uh, Turkehurst writes, Remember who you are. Don't compromise for anyone, for any reason. You are a child of the Almighty God. Live that truth. And Nikki Gumbel says, we're made for relationships. Human beings can survive without sex. Human beings cannot survive without relationships. And so uh, God will, will give us, a, a sex may be a great gift, but it's not the greatest gift. The greatest gift is relationships in the body of Christ. The greatest gift is, is desire for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hearts are restless, O God, until they find their rest in thee. It's in those uh, Christian relationships and friendships with each other and then in our relationship with God. Epithumia is the Greek word that is translated as lust uh, that Jesus uses here in the in the Sermon on the Mount. But it is exactly the same word that Paul uses in Philippians 1 verse 23, where he says, I epithumia, I lust. Same word Jesus uses, I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. Uh, we can replace our, our, our lust in areas that get us into trouble, we can replace it with a desire, epithumia, uh, a, a lust, a desire, to be closer to Christ and to be closer and, uh, to each other within Christ. Uh, Galatians 5, verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Let's close with this.